With Heart Rhythm TV from the HRS Scientific Session in San Francisco, I'm Dan Aliash here uh, with a state-of-the-art sarcoid, cardiac sarcoid update. And I'm joined today by new friends and old. We have Dr. Tom Crawford from the University of Michigan, my old faculty. Dr. Costa Siontis, now at the Mayo Clinic, we were co-fellows at Michigan. And a new friend, Dr. Usha Tedro from the Brigham Hospital. Welcome. Thank you. So I want to Thanks. start off with um, the timely update. Uh, Thomas, you were presented a session from the International Cardiac Sarcoidosis Consortium regarding outcomes, morbidity, and mortality. Will you summarize for us the salient points? Yes, sure. Um, so, first of all, thank you for addressing this important topic. You know, patients with sarcoidosis are very difficult to manage. They're very difficult to diagnose to begin with. Um, we, for a number of years now, we've had a, a, a registry of 20-some uh, centers that have accrued over 600 patients. And so over the years, we've been able to report on various things like uh, you know, predictors of appropriate uh, ICD discharges or, um, predict or basically the role of MRI in risk stratification. And of course, VT, which, uh, which uh, will be discussed a bit later. But um, I guess to just say what happened uh, today during the oral presentation. So we're, we're discussing um, adverse cardiac outcomes in patients with sarcoidosis after the diagnosis. Diagnosis is oftentimes delayed, um, but the, we basically uh, took a composite uh, endpoints of uh, death, heart transplantation, ALVET, or appropriate ICD therapy, and a third of our patients were actually um, ex experiencing one of those uh, or more. Um, and the most notable predictors of bad outcomes were um, prior VT or VF, uh, and uh, New York Heart Association class, as well as prior use of antiarrhythmic drugs. So these are antiarrhythmic drugs that were used either for VT or atrial fibrillation before patient was actually diagnosed. Surprisingly, um, complete heart block was not a predictor of, of worse outcome. Great, well that's a wonderful summary. You know, observational data suggests that, you know, Cardiac sarcoidosis is a lot less rare than we realize, and we should actually up our index of suspicion. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn to my co-fellow here, Costas. Um, you used this database to publish a very interesting study in JAMA Cardiology last fall yeah. uh, with regards to VT ablation and actually even in patients with some active inflammation. So will you comment yeah. a little bit about what you learned? Yeah, so we, we found that more than 50% of the patients that we analyzed, it was a study of 160 or so patients uh, f from centers from around the world, um, US, Asia, Europe. And more than 50% of those patients had a VT recurrence after ablation. You know, at a first glance, this is, this is worrisome. It's, it's concerning. We are disappointed to see it. Yeah. Uh, but when you look a little further, actually, a lot of those patients were able to come off antiarrhythmics. Mm -hmm. The ICD shocks came down significantly. VT storm was eliminated in 80% of those patients who had VT storm before ablation. Mm -hmm. So, so as a, as a result, you know, we we are we were positive in saying that VT ablation has value in managing um, uh, these patients, uh, the complicated patients, as Thomas mentioned. You mentioned inflammation. I think it was a very important variable uh, yeah. in our analysis. Uh, we had data for a little more than 75% of those patients who had PET scanning uh, just before ablation, and. Inflammation is an adverse predictor of outcome, both for the ablation outcome, but also for the long-term outcome. But even if those patients had inflammation and VT storm, outcomes were improved from the standpoint of reducing ICD really? shocks, um, being able to come off antiarrhythmics. But again, sarcoidosis is a condition that we can ablate all you want, but if the inflammation is there, it's primarily an inflammatory condition, so that has to be under control. It's, it's a disease that you have to manage with your rheumatologist, with your heart failure specialist. Um, to optimize patient outcome uh, oh, uh, at the end of the day. The other thing I will mention yeah. is that, you know, there's a delay from presentation to diagnosis, but also a delay from diagnosis of VT or presentation of VT to ablation. Mm -hmm. In this series, in expert centers, the t time from presentation with VT to first ablation was more than a year. So patients were managed with antiarrhythmics, keep getting ICD shocks. So the threshold to take someone for VT ablation, even in that expert center series, was pretty high. Yeah. I do think that the message here is that that threshold should probably come down a little bit. Um, again, with expert management, with heart failure specialists, rheumatologists, pulmonologists, whoever else needs to be involved. But VT ablation should not be a feared 
intervention in this population, as long as we, we realize that it's, it might take in more than just one procedure, uh, it will take a lot of immunosuppression down the road, um, and potentially, again, this, these patients don't just have ET, they also have heart failure. Eventually, heart transplant or advanced therapies need to be part of the, part of the picture and, and the management portfolio. A very, very nice summary, Kostas. And I was impressed in reading that paper, but the number of patients that actually were on steroids, that were on immune suppression, and then getting ablation. Um, Usha, I'm going to take the next question to you. Kind of the interplay between um, immune suppression, pet positivity, managing these arrhythmias with ablation or other things. Can you comment on your general approach there? Yeah, absolutely. I think one of the really interesting um, things that came out of your study was uh, the the persistently positive PET scan patients really did have poorer outcomes than the patients in whom you could suppress the PET positivity. And what we don't know is if you somehow had a magical medicine that could get rid of the inflammation, could you turn those people into more successful ablation candidates down the road? And one of the ways I used to always think about VT in patients with cardiac sarcoid is kind of in two buckets, like the patients that have had inflammation before, it's healed up and it's left scar tissue behind mm -hmm. and that scar is now a substrate for a re-entrant VT and then the other group are these folks that have more automatic VTs that um, that are related to persistent inflammation so I always thought if we went and looked at the PET scans that the the area of inflammation would tell us where the automatic VTs were coming from but one of our fellows is presenting today later this afternoon some really interesting data that suggests that the areas where the automatic VTs come from are the usual suspects places that are prone to getting automat automaticity anyway, and they don't necessarily anatomically correlate that well with the area that lights up on the PET scan, suggesting that inflammation is maybe more of a systemic disease. Mm. Um, and so maybe that tells us a little bit of why we're not as good at maybe taking a substrate-based VT ablation approach to some of these patients. Well, well thank the fantastic summary. So I'd like to take it to a, a final question, which is a challenging question, I think, in clinical practice, which is the risk stratification prior to uh, device implantation. So would, it, would any of you be willing to share your approach and, and, and so we can get a sense for how, we, how people are doing this? Yeah, I can take a shot of this, it's a yeah. challenge. Um, I, I do struggle a lot with a patient who has ectopy, not sustained VT necessarily, that's a simple, simple yeah. decision, but has ventricular ectopy, perhaps a little more complex than just simple PVCs, has inflammation, ejection fraction is borderline, maybe not mm -hmm. 35%, there's no pacing indication. That's really the patient where we struggle a lot. Um, I do think there's a, there's a role for um, EP study and program ventricular stimulation, those po that population. I think the specificity of that tends to, to be a little lower if you have a lot of inflammation, you know, things you induce with doubles or triples may not necessarily make clinical sense. Um, I think it's an area of investigation. We're looking at our own experiences, see how these people do long-term, uh, the FITA profile mm -hmm. with inflammation and borderline ejection fraction. My overall sense is that in a patient who's not terribly young and has known sarcoidosis with inflammation that may not be immediately amenable to suppression with, with steroids or other advanced biologics. I don't think that anyone will be at fault for doing the safe thing and putting a defibrillator in. Yeah. Um, if, if, if in a really gray zone and a, and a lot of doubt, I would err on the side of putting a defibrillator in. But again, this is a little more of a personal approach of doing this. I, I wonder I can how jump you guys in here. So we, that. We, yeah. you know, we've looked at um, the role of MRI in uh, and, and late gadolinium human enhancement in predicting outcomes, uh, especially ICD therapies. And so one of the projects we did was to look at patients with preserved ejection fraction, because mm -hmm. you know those whose ejection fraction is less than 35% fall under different broader mm -hmm. uh, guideline um, driven um, recommendations. But uh, what we found is that uh, pr the presence of delayed enhancement, the extent of it, and especially the right ventricular delayed enhancement were strong predictors of, um, of subsequent um, ICD therapies.
Yeah, I would just add one other thing is that the group in whom I'm a bit more aggressive is the people who have known extra cardiac mm. sarcoid because we know that they at some point have have a significant risk, maybe 10%, 20% of them will develop cardiac sarcoid down the road. And we don't know how often to screen them. We don't really know. Um, oh. We don't know how to work them up appropriately. So I use a lot of loop recorders in that mm -hmm. group if I'm not sure. Yeah. But if they have some definitive um, oh. evidence on imaging of cardiac involvement, I'm pretty aggressive with that right. group. There, there was a very nice study uh, published out of Duke in about 2008 or so by Dr. Patel, Manish Patel, who, um, who essentially showed this, that when patients are scanned for non-clinical reasons, you know, j basically they had uh, a research scanner and they were scanning sarcoid patients, they found that the presence of delayed enhancement uh, was a better uh, predictor of whether the patient actually fits the uh, criteria, the, the Japanese criteria for the diagnosis, and of course the delayed enhancement also played a pivotal role in risk stratification between patients who are going to need a pacemaker, an ICD, or who are going to die. No, I think it's a very, a very good point. A good quality MRI, understanding the LG helps you with that risk stratification. Uh, and what about the adage of I'm putting a device in somebody, it's going to be a defibrillator. Are people on board with that? or? Yeah, I think if there's a pacing <laughs> indication, to me, that, that is a high-risk patient. The reason they get complete heart block is because they have a lot of substrate, and I think the patient should get a defibrillator. Yeah. I would also make one other point uh, before we close in, in that diagnosis and making sure you have tissue evidence that this is sarcoidosis is very important. If there's extra cardiac sarcoidosis and imaging evidence from a PET scan or an MRI, I think that's, that's pretty clear and clean. Mm -hmm. But if, if we're talking about the presumed isolated cardiac sarcoidosis where the, the heart is the only organ uh, involved, we do make an effort to always verify that with, with, bi with a biopsy, either EP-guided or conventional, a little more EP-guided um, in the latest years. The reason being that not everything that lights up on the PET scan is sarcoidosis. And we, with genetic testing now, we recognize that more and more there's non-ischemic cardiomyopathies that can make a, a PET scan uh, be positive. Um, that we really should not be immunosuppressing these patients. They should be on aggressive heart failure regimen, but mm. not, yeah, you know, potentially yeah. dangerous it, immunosuppression. Yeah, I think Usha brought up a point of confusion around, you know, certain uh, stages of ARVC and PET yeah. positivity. Yeah. yeah, that's right. I feel like years ago we used to be on, in this situation where people gave uh, folks the diagnosis of ARVC and they turned out to have sarcoid when we did the biopsy. Mm -hmm. But now it feels like it's coming full circle because there's some great work from one of my colleagues at the Brigham, Neil Lakdawalla, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. looked at um, the DSP variant patients um, with presumed ARVC type of phenotype, and a lot of those folks go through an inflammatory phase exactly. where they have a lot of automatic arrhythmias, yeah. so and it's very exactly similar. that's exactly what I was referring to. Yeah. Exactly right, mm -hmm. yeah. So now that we've gone full circle, I, um, I'd like to close and, and thank all the discussants. This has been the HRS um, State of the Art Update for cardiac sarcoidosis, and thank you for joining us.